The title of this panel is Privacy Impact Assessments and Democracy, Safeguarding Voter Data. This afternoon we'll be taking a deeper look into the special value of privacy impact assessments in the US and data protection impact assessments in the EU and the relationship between these privacy tools and protecting elections. So first we're gonna have five minute presentations by each of the panelists, followed by a moderated discussion and then brief time at the end for audience questions. To keep everyone on time, I'll wave this when your five minutes is up and then at the end of the discussion to leave time at the end for questions. We'll be ending a few minutes early at 6.15 to allow time to get to the um, Epic International Privacy Champion Awards here in this room. I hope everyone can make it. Um, and now to introduce our panelists. First, our moderator is Jen Daskal, an associate professor of law at American University Washington College of Law, where she teaches and writes about criminal, national security, and constitutional law. Our speakers include Mark Grotenberg, President of and Executive Director of the Electronic Privacy Information Center, EPIC, a nonprofit focused on emerging privacy and civil liberties issues based out of Washington, D.C. He also teaches privacy law at Georgetown Law. Romina Garrido is a lawyer specializing in data protection and cybersecurity and the founder of the Fundación Datos Protegidos, a nonprofit based in Chile which promotes privacy and data protection as fundamental rights. Amber McIntyre is a researcher in the use of technology in politics and activism, and she's currently working with the Tactical Techs, Our Data Ourselves project, a project looking at the use of personal data within the political process. And Julia Zickle is the head of the International Department at the Hungarian National Authority for Data Protection and Freedom of Information. With that, over to you, Jen. Great. Um, so thanks all of you for coming. We are going to jump right into the presentations um, and then we're going to have um, a bit of a discussion amongst the panelists up here and then turn it over to you for questions and answers. So I'm going to um, invite Mark to begin us, to start us off, please. So thank you so much. I'm going to race through a series of slides, uh, Pecha Kucha style on the theme of data protection and democracy. And I will focus on a case that Epic brought against uh, President Trump's Advisory Commission on Election Integrity in 2017. And I need to make clear at the outset that Epic is a nonpartisan, non-political uh, organization. We've actually brought more lawsuits against uh, President Obama and President Clinton than we have against President uh, Trump and President uh, Bush. But as you will see, I hope in this presentation, there were unique issues that arose from the decision of President Trump in May of 2017 to announce a commission that would investigate allegations of voter fraud in the United States. Uh, this is a very controversial claim. There's very little evidence of voter fraud in the United States. And immediately, voting rights organizations and civil rights organizations were concerned that the actual aim of this commission was voter suppression. That was to intimidate and threaten eligible voters and thereby diminish voting participation in the United States. And you see one of the critical articles that comes out almost immediately describes the presidential commission as a commission on voter uh, suppression. In uh, June of uh, 2017, not long after the president had announced the commission and named the vice president, Michael Pence, the chair, the executive director of the uh, commission, a, a controversial uh, character in US voting law, this Kansas Secretary of State, Chris Kobach, wrote to all of the state election officials and he said to them that the president's commission looked forward to working with them on this important task. But he also told the state election officials that the commission established by the president provide to the commission uh, detailed voting histories. And this is the information 
that the Presidential Commission was seeking, not just the names of the registrants or where they lived or their date of birth, but also their political party, the last four digits of their social security number, voting history, their uh, status as a voter, uh, information regarding felony convictions, past voter registration, military status, and so on it goes. These were all records that were maintained at the local level by the states to ensure the integrity of the state election system, but this information had never been sought before by the federal uh, government. And this immediately ignited a uh, controversy, and as I said, this is a controversy that goes right to the heart of democratic governance and voter uh, participation. Uh, my organization, uh, EPIC, the Electronic Privacy Information Center, decided that there was a legal strategy that we could pursue to protect the interests of the state voters and frustrate the attempts of the Presidential Commission to gather the data. We determined that the Commission was required by a federal law to undertake a privacy impact assessment before it began the collection of the state uh, voter data. And because they had failed to undertake the privacy impact assessment, we filed a lawsuit and said that the commission's activities must be uh, suspended. Um, and this is our filing uh, against the commission. As you can see, we sued the secretary, we sued the vice president, we sued lots and lots of people, and there are many Christmas parties we will not be invited to in the future. But that's what happens when you bring a lawsuit. Um, the lawsuit received a lot of attention in the United States. And we used uh, the privacy claim to support the efforts of civil rights groups and democratic rights groups to explain that the efforts to take this data from the states was in fact a violation of this legal obligation to conduct a privacy impact assessment. And the suit had almost an immediate impact because by filing this lawsuit, a judge determined that it was necessary to temporarily suspend these activities. And the director of the commission decided that he would tell the state, stop sending us the data. We are going to delete the data we have uh, received until we can determine if we have legal authority to go forward. In effect, we had successfully uh, suspended the program at least in the middle of July 2016. Simultaneously with the litigation, we also launched a state-based effort in which we drew attention to the widespread public opposition to the Presidential Commission's efforts to gather the state voter data. And we were very careful to note that the opposition was coming both from the Democrats, which is to say the opponents of, of President Trump, as well as the Republicans, which were the members of Trump's own party. Um, I was very proud of, of this particular uh, moment. I've testified many times before the U.S. Congress, but on this occasion I testified with leaders of the civil rights movement and also the state secretaries who are responsible for uh, protecting the integrity of the state electoral system. And the point in the image is to underscore that the privacy claim in this instance was deeply embedded with the protection of the voting rights in the United States. We were in a common purpose with the civil rights groups and the state uh, secretaries. Congress wrote to the Vice President of the United States, cited our lawsuit, expressed concern about the absence of the privacy impact assessment, and over the subsequent months, uh, opposition built. Now, we received an adverse opinion, and I need to tell you that the outcome here is not, you know, all uh, perfect. Uh, there was a legal judgment that said that our theory did not work because, in fact, the commission was not an agency subject to this obligation. Uh, because of the unique way it had been created, um, the judge actually held the obligation, while it would apply as a general matter, did not apply in this instance. We think the, the court was wrong on that point, but that, that is also part of the story. Um, nonetheless, and this is the exciting part, as we built the campaign, as we worked with Congress, as opposition grew, and as our technical experts determined that the data had originally been stored on a White House computer system which was explicitly designated not to receive personal data, 
okay? That's where they decided to store it. Um, they gave up. They gave up. And here is um, the announcement from the White House in January of 2018 uh, from President Trump by the authority vested in me as president by the Constitution and the laws of the United States. Uh, he terminated uh, the commission. There was a lot more to this story, but I promised to do this all in five minutes and provide background, so I will stop there. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mark. Um, this is really, um, despite the, the adverse court ruling, a real success story that highlights the intersection of privacy rights and voting rights. And I wanna now turn it over to, to Julia. Yeah, thank you very much. So representing a national data protection authority, I have to start with a positive statement, and that is all DPAs have warmly welcomed the introduction of a data protection impact assessment as a tool into the GDPR. But uh, I don't know if you know that, strangely enough, there is no exact definition provided in the text of the GDPR. The relevant recital and paragraphs and the relevant rules are there, of course. But uh, I think it's very important uh, to clarify the essence of this tool. And uh, let me recall the definition uh, given by two academics, uh, David Wright and Paul DeHert, saying that privacy impact assessment is a tool, a process, a methodology to identify, assess, mitigate, or avoid privacy risks, and in collaboration with stakeholders to identify solutions. And of course, this tool has its uh, history, its roots in uh, privacy uh, history, because already in the 1990s, it was the Commonwealth uh, countries, Australia, New Zealand, uh, uh, Canada, uh, which uh, already introduced and used and developed uh, these tools. And of course, there were uh, many differences in the national uh, usage, for example, uh, regarding this, the scope of object of the examination process or the scope of the subject, whether uh, uh, privacy impact assessment was part of the risk assessment or not, whether strategy was uh, part of the privacy impact assessment or not. Uh, whether there was an obligation to identify the privacy advantages, for example, in Canada, whether consultation with external stakeholders was supported, or a very important formal criteria in the USA that a privacy impactment uh, report uh, should be signed by the management of the organization. So afterwards, the management cannot uh, say that they were not aware uh, of the risks, they were not aware of the facts and details of the data controlling process. Uh, and, of course, uh, they have to take their responsibility uh, after uh, the signature. So the GDPR uh, introduced this new tool and uh, the Article 29 Working Party uh, did its work as well in 2016, issuing a very detailed guidelines, uh, analyzing uh, the obligations and the expectations on the other side of uh, the usage and uh, 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 the introduction of this tool. And uh, just uh, closing to our uh, concrete uh, subject, what uh, a data protection impact assessment uh, with electoral privacy uh, has to do. It has to do a lot. There is a concrete uh, and direct connection between uh, the two subjects because uh, uh, there are cases uh, as regulated in the GDPR when a mandatory uh, DPIA completion is necessary. And uh, uh, these are the cases when the, the data controlling activities are likely to result in high risks. And when speaking about political opinions, political beliefs, uh, then we are speaking about sensitive data. And that is uh, one of the cases when such mandatory uh, assessment uh, uh, have to be made. Or the other case is when automated decision making or profiling uh, is on the scope. And uh, that may happen uh, uh, in this territory as well. Or a very wide uh, surveillance or very wide uh, scope of uh, data controlling. And speaking about the EPIC scandal, it, uh, there were about uh, uh, 157 uh, million voters uh, involved. So what, what is a large scale if that is not? So uh, upon my understanding, the corner stores uh, of uh, 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 
making a data protection impact assessment and uh, electoral privacy uh, are four or five points. Uh, one is uh, that uh, uh, setting up such an assessment or uh, assessment report is uh, mandatory in most cases. Of course, there is an exception provided by the GDPR uh, in Article 35, uh, subparagraph 10, when the DPIA has already been carried out as part of the general impact assessment. So a question uh, arises, so what happens when uh, such a general report, a general assessment has already been made during the legislation making uh, process, then what uh, happens with this obligation then? Uh, the assessment uh, uh, must concentrate very much on data security questions since all the scandals uh, connected to this uh, subject have some weak points concerning uh, data security. The principle of data minimization plays a vital role because uh, it is an obligation from the side of the data controllers to use as minimum amount of personal data as it is possible for their uh, purposes. And of course, the rights and freedoms of the data subject must be very much respected since any kind of infringement, any kind of data breach may uh, have uh, tragic consequences on the private life, on the private sphere uh, of the persons uh, involved. So the EPIC case uh, was already described by uh, our most uh, expert uh, colleague, but uh, there are of course other uh, cases which have to be mentioned. For example, the Cambridge Analytica case uh, uh, concerning UK uh, citizens. And uh, I have to quote just a few sentences uh, from uh, uh, the ICO commissioner uh, investigation report uh, saying that the formal warnings included a demand for each party to provide data protection impact assessments for all projects involving the use of personal data. So that is a very clear statement, a very strict uh, interpretation of uh, uh, the GDPR. And I think this is, since uh, this is already uh, uh, finished uh, statement or, or report, uh, we have to take into consideration very much uh, her words. And uh, I would like just to mention very briefly uh, a case which happened before in Hungary, before uh, the applicability time of the GDPR, but uh, I think this is also some uh, similar case which could have been uh, avoided when a uh, data protection impact assessment uh, had been made. That uh, uh, was uh, uh, infringing electoral privacy of many people, that was the so-called Yandex case, because on the website of the national consultation run by the Prime Minister's office, I don't know if uh, you are aware of the fact that uh, Hungarian Prime Minister and Prime Minister's office likes to consult uh, the people very much, so uh, uh, directly uh, asks questions, written questions, that is called a national consultation, and it happens at least once a year. And uh, on this website, an analytical service was supplied by Yandex uh, company, which is uh, in slang called the uh, Russian Google, to create usage statistics and to analyze user habit and sending all first interactions of the user, including name, email address and age provided during uh, the national consultation. And this uh, data packet uh, containing all personal data of the user was sent to the nearest server, uh, either to Russia, to Finland or uh, the Netherlands. Then our uh, authority uh, started an investigation and uh, it ended with very strict uh, uh, demands and warnings uh, against the data controllers uh, just uh, to avoid uh, such uh, uh, breakage or breaking uh, or injuring uh, uh, voters' uh, privacy. So this is, I just mentioned it, not because of uh, any, uh, there was any obligation to make a data protection impact assessment, but only because uh, to emphasize the fact that uh, had there been any data protection impact assessment uh, uh, made before, prior to the data controlling, such mistakes, uh, such infringements could have been avoided. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, it raises really important questions about when privacy impact assessments are required and what's the scope of, of what they look like. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Remina to talk about how this is playing out in Chile. Hi. Um, first of all, very thank you to um, EPIC for the invitation to this panel, to this conference. Um, I came from Chile, 
um, this is a very exciting topic for me because locate privacy in the center of the debate of the freedom of information. And we are following all, af all this afternoon the debate of the how data protection could be a tool or could be the answer to the to the to, con to try to control propaganda with uh, in in, so in social network at the negative impacts of ma micro targeting. Uh, we are spoke about this all the afternoon. So in, in Datos Protegidos, uh, uh, an, a small organization that had found in Chile, we did a report uh, in 2018 supported by Tactical Tech. And in, in this report, we analyzed the data and elections in Chile. It was the first and the only report in that issue. It was two object, main object, objectives. First, describe uh, the situation of, of, of uh, electoral law in Chile related with the use of data and describe how this uh, could be a match with the data protection law in Chile. Um, the, or, data prote or electoral law in Chile has certain rules of how to process data in the electoral context. And since 2016, uh, because we have in whole Latin America, not only in Chile, a process of uh, anti-corruption and transparency, many of um, public frameworks was changing. Um, one of the objective of this, of this legal changes was the transparency of the electoral process. And focused on following this transparency, in 2016, uh, the Congress decided to publish all the electoral role. As different as Mark says, uh, the electoral role published every election completely with all personal data or all the possible voters in Chile, with a lot of personal information like name, address, gender, uh, age, uh, and the place that we vote. So it's a lot of data, personal data that we, we uh, that the law make public. So how? We can meet, uh, how can we do a match with the data protection law in that issue? And it was one of the main questions of this research. And then we analyze in this scenario, in this scenario of the, of the, we have to publish all this data and we don't have a data protection authority, how the, the political parties, uh, or how was the behavior of political parties in, in this in, in this issue. And, and we analyzed the election of 2017, the presidential election, and we find in, in our finding, um, we can realize that in Chile, it was an emerging industry of data targeting also. It's not just things that like happen in the United States or in Europe or in Russia, happen in a small country also like in Chile. And there we found all, at least seven companies dedicated to micro targeting and they sell services to the political party in this uh, a scenario of uh, with no regulation of no data protection of authority uh, at all. So uh, we, we do some conclusion of this report. Um, one of the conclusion is very related with its panel and is the part of the solution would be technical solution. And I think that the PS, the privacy impact assessment, are technical tools who help to, to put all the stakeholders in certain organization to focus it and how the data should be processing for, I don't know, for, for fulfill certain objectives. Um, and of course, security is uh, is also in the center of this um, of, of of these technical tools that we have to consider to to processing data in electoral context because it's a reality that uh, in years these ways to process data for many purposes in for data targeting in electoral control will be more and more sophisticated day by day. And 
I don't know, so sure it's possible to ban. Uh, um, but I think that we 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 should put some limits, um, and these technical tools could be part of this solution of this answer. Who have to protect rights, human rights, and in second place, it's not possible to think in a privacy impact assessment. Just thinking in data privacy, we have to integrate also the uh, electoral legislation because the electoral law has an, has an objective too and could be a good of objective, a loyalty of objective like the transparency of the electoral process and a specific rules to processing the data for goal this objective. Um, but all the focuses, and I think this was the mistake in many Latin American countries is just put just the focus in transparency of the election in no in the way that the political parties processing the data when when they have to achieve have the legitimate objectives of being elected in an elections. Uh, finally, Pia's for who the Epic case, the PIA was for the Presidential Commission, but we are discussing all this day about the responsibility of the private companies who provide that, that data. And in the Chilean case, the data came from private companies, like the major companies of social network, of course, Facebook and Google and Twitter, that allows the micro-targeting, but also, pro uh, also the data came from the state from the state who published the data and make it available for third company who send these services to the these uh, buyers, to the politicals that have to the legitimate right, I think, to do propaganda. But where are the limits? Great, thank you. Thank you for sharing that and um, really kind of a cautionary and important um, discussion about the ways in which so much private data had been made public via um, the, the election rolls and voting rolls. I want to turn it over to Amber now, who I think is going to offer a slightly more pessimistic um, view about what um, can be accomplished through privacy impact assessments. So thanks, Amber. Um, thank you. Uh, I yeah, I was, try I was writing it out, and I was like, how do I make this not pessimistic? Um, so I'd like to see it as a a challenge for the way in which people could try and perhaps get the law to work for them, um, whichever way that, that ends up working, whether it's in pro, pro for privacy or pro business or pro government. So I, I just think there's areas of ambiguity and um, following actually what Julia said, I like the, this idea of like clarifying the essence of the tool. And I think that one part that isn't clarified is just the concept of personal data itself, which um, so I've been researching at Tactical Tech and that's a question that comes up time and time again is where's the limit and, and what does personal mean? Um, and for a privacy impact assessment, and I'm not a lawyer, so hopefully I've got this right because it's the basis of what I'm going to say, but it has, it's generally got to be attached to an identifiable individual. And um, so I want to just talk about how that and how the concept of um, what's politically sensitive um, can affect what, what we count as personal data covered by privacy impact assessments. Um, firstly, so privacy impact assessments cover this data which is for an individual. Um, but it, this isn't the only type of way that we can consider personal data to be an asset for political campaigns or governments or anyone to persuade, communicate, um, target individuals. Um, to sort of clarify what identifiable data is and also the sort of data that's been covered by the Privacy Impact Framework assessment so far, um, as Mark showed in the um, case, in the EPIC case against the Commission, um, this was the full first and last name of registrants, this was the middle names, addresses, dates of birth, political parties and voting history, it was whether they've had any convictions, um, their voter registration and military status, um, roughly between 10 to 15 data points. Um, personal data can be a lot broader than that. Um, it can re represent all sorts of things, which I won't get too much into detail because I think probably most people know that, but 
as like an example to compare that with, um, Haystack DNA and Aristotle, who are data brokers in the US, have um, between four and 5,000 data points on each individual compared to the 10 to 15 in the case. And I think one of the problems, and, and those points can be not all political, but many of them can be too. So they claim to have points on whether individuals support LGBT rights, whether they have what their attitudes towards Trump are, um, towards gun ownership. So it's much broader than voting history and who they're going to vote for perhaps in the next um, election. Um, I think one of the problems of trying to cover this data with a privacy impact assessment, I mean, it's massive, but it's also because um, a lot of this data is modeled from other data. Um, and I'm not a te technical expert either, so I'm going to try and explain this in a brief way that I understand, um, which is that um, you have a collection of data points and from that you can sort of predict what a, a final or another data point would be. For example, by looking at my gender and where I live and what my shopping habits are, they can decide what my support probably will be for a certain candidate. Maybe it's because I live in a district with lots of schools. Maybe it's because I live near a prison. There's lots of different ways that you can then kind of predict another data point for me. Um, other than the fact that these data points are not actually true, they're, they're predicted, they're, they're possibly true. They're in an average sort of 80 to 90% might be true. They might be 50% may be true. Um, so other than the fact that they're a personal data point put against my name, which aren't, haven't, hasn't been gathered directly from me, um, a lot of the time they are kept separate from an individual. So I want to talk about how the data isn't attached to an individual and how this will affect it. So this model data will often be kept in a, um, maybe in an algorithm that they can then apply. So they'll work out how they get to that data point and then they'll keep an algorithm which will get them to that data point, but they don't actually attach that to any individual until they need to. So they can have loads of data on your shopping habits or location or your um, credit score, um, your family history, but they won't know any political data points yet because it's kept in this sort of model that they'll apply when they need to. Um, Forever, that, that can be then created to create profiles and then it will never be, they'll target sort of groups of people, like it will be targeting a group of a specific gender, people who live in a certain area. They'll target people who are like entering a specific shop if they've got that location data. Um, they can, yeah, there's lots of different ways they can keep it at this group profile level. <laughs> Wouldn't be covered, I think currently by what a privacy impact assessment covers. Um, or perhaps, I mean, this is the challenge, does it and, and could it cover that sort of data? And if so, what would that look like? Um, so this sort of data, as I've said, can be used to profile individuals, target them, and can be kept in formats that are anonymous. Um, another part that I'd just like to add to that is like where, that, where those profiles that are like group profiles or the sort of model or algorithm that gets you to that data point, um, where they sit is also not always clear. So it might sit with the political party, um, it might sit with, I think you were mentioning that in Chile there was seven, seven com sort of consultants or data companies. Um, at Tactical Tech we did research that found over and above Cambridge Analytica and across, across the world there's 330 different companies working with data um, advising political parties. And like that's a massive amount of people to sort of like work out who's got the data. Some of them are digital consultants that work for the party, and then they go to a data brokers. So trying to like follow the data is incredibly difficult. Um, I also want to mention then the breadth of, breadth of data, which I think is important in, um, I understand in the GDPR ruling, uh, or how GDPR works with the data protection um, impact assessments, that it, if it's got political sensitivity, then this is a really um, this is when you have to put more safeguards in place, or you have to work out when you're going to delete it and how secure it's going to be. And what can is considered politically sensitive um, is still, I think, up for debate. But I also think that there's stuff which I, which we wouldn't look at as politically sensitive at all at the moment. For example, our, the things I've been mentioning, like our shopping habits. But now everything we do online can be. And, and everything that they can measure us doing offline and, and collect in a database can be modeled to work out some other political data point on us. So at what point of the process do we decide how risky it is and how do we decide what its intentions are going to be and who else is going to use it and trying to work out um, the risk of data that doesn't look politically sensitive but can become politically sensitive. 
Um, and another uh, sort of final way that I would like to think about how that political sensitivity changes is um, to give like a, a small example from one of my pieces of research. I looked at how privacy impact assessments were working. I, I mean, the broader thing was how data is being used in an NGO um, and a campaigning organization. And they had an incredibly thorough privacy impact assessment for what they called individuals at risk. That was people that they were campaigning on behalf of, people who are at risk of imprisonment or torture, that, they, that, that was top of their priority to make sure that that data was kept secure. And they had absolutely nothing to protect anyone who was on their email lists, who've signed up to receive information, who've, um, who donate to the company, and who, to, who or to the organization, sorry, donors and members and audience, um, they don't have anything to protect these because I think at the moment it's viewed that these, like being signed up to an LGBT organization because you want to support their cause isn't seen as risky in the UK where this is, this context of this was. Um, but then that's, that's a sliding political context in which it suddenly could become risky just to be a member of an organization that supports refugee rights, LGBT rights. So at what point do you decide the because I understand that the assessment has to be done whenever there's a change, but at what point do you decide, decide that there's been a change in risk of this information? Um, and how do you get that from the start? So yeah, I hope that helps. Great, thank you. That raises, I think, a number of really important and provocative questions. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna, I'm gonna pose a question to the panelists, and then I encourage all of you to come up with questions. There is a mic there, so if you have a question, um, please come up to the mic and um, ask a question, not a, not a statement, but please come up, start thinking about and coming up with your questions. But before we turn it over to the audience, um, I wanna pick up where Amber left off. And obviously, as Mark talked about, the failure to do a privacy impact assessment, assuming that, that the commission was required to do so, is, is a problem. But how do we ensure that once they're done, they're done right? and that they're done in ways that, that establish meaningful red lines. Now there's a million different issues that we can talk about with respect to that. Um, so I just wanted to get some perspectives of some of the key things that need to be considered. And in particular, thinking about um, the role of consent. Is it enough to get consent of the individual to then share the data with, another, with, with others or are there limitations to the consent-based model as well? So whoever wants to start. Okay, so um, since this case, we've actually taken on many more privacy impact assessments and we've thought about this issue. Under the US federal law, the E-Government Act, Section 208 is actually very explicit. Consent doesn't even play a role. There's a checklist of about a dozen items that agencies need to consider before they create a new system of records and to Amber's point, the, the larger the system, the more data, the more impact, the more likely a privacy impact assessment uh, will be uh, required. But here, I think, is the most important conclusion we've reached, which is that for a privacy impact assessment to be meaningful, the organization that undertakes it actually has to be prepared not to go forward with the system if it concludes that it can't satisfy all the requirements of the privacy impact assessment. And I think this is not well understood. I think the expectation, particularly within large organizations, when confronted with the obligation to do a privacy impact assessment, is that this is one of the boxes to check. We'll prepare the reports, we'll get the approval, and then we'll go forward as we planned. But in fact, that's really not what's contemplated here. And what is so interesting about our particular case in the US involving the Presidential Commission is the privacy impact assessment would have revealed in fact that you cannot collect and store state voter data on an insecure system. So that's our main point. Um, I think, yeah, it's really interesting to hear about those other cases and, and see this, how the scope changes as the more cases are taken on. Um, I. I think I'll like return to like the point I'll just keep going on about, which is like how difficult and the concept of like data that's attached to an individual is to it, and and how that with in that case you can consider what it is to get consent, but there's also data that's used um, to create these profiles. For example, from like um, if someone 
browser's website so you can track where people have clicked on your website and how long they stayed on a certain page and um, sort of generic, like how many people went to a certain event or how many people entered a certain area. And for these cases, it's not considered that you even need consent um, because it's anonymized and it's broad. But then from that, profiles are created and then attached to an individual. Um, so I think the consent will, can help so much, but it, it wouldn't be able to assist in situations where I think that the problem is is that that data is considered like the owner, like if it's your website, then it's data relating to your website, not to people, but it's used then to profile people. Um, so at what point do you do you ask people, um, is it okay for us to decide that you like this sort of thing? I, in one case, I um, a charity was talking to me about how they might try and fix that, and they were like wondering if at the end of all their emails, they would write what they call that type of like they target all their emails to different groups and they wanted to write at the bottom of the emails like you're in, ta you're in target group A and they're like but then target group C would just be called lazy email readers and like <laughs> that's the sort of data they gather that isn't attached to an individual but then they profile and it, and it affects what they do. I, I would like to ask a consent I think it's not enough uh, because it's a tricky issue when we speak about uh, the behavior of people in digital spaces of, on, on the web. I think that it's more important to consider the aspect like data minimization, as you said, security aspect, of course, and try to integrate in the, in the, in the, elabor in the make in the process of of the PIA, all visions in the in the org organization, not just the not just the normative point of view, also the technical point of view, and considering also, as I said before, not just privacy rules included in the data protection framework specific. We have to uh, fit two important aspects with electoral law and data protection law. And I think it's uh, a key issue. And also think that this is not an, a tool that we do, a document that we do and we storage in, I don't know, what, what's, what, uh, in a box and we forget about it. It's a continuous process. And if the, and as Amber said, if the data change the purpose that I want to use it, I, Probably, I must repeat the exercise and ana analyze again everything. But I think uh, uh, I think the minimum content uh, of such uh, assessment is included in the GDPR. So the uh, exact, exact and systematic description of the all the operations, the legitimate interest and the legal ground behind the processing uh, should be there. Uh, or the risks which may affect uh, other people's rights and freedoms should be there and the measures should be introduced just to mitigate and avoid or the privacy risks. And if uh, upon the understanding of the data controllers these measures are not satisfactory, then he has the obligation to uh, turn to the supervisory authority and initiate uh, a prior consultation. And uh, on the other side, uh, the supervisory authority has uh, fear duties and fear to do with uh, uh, such assessments. It, uh, when we uh, just look at uh, the very uh, difficult uh, and uh, comp uh, complicated uh, structure uh, and environment uh, around the uh, data protection impact assessment, it has contact and meeting points with the codes of conduct, with this obligatory prior consultation. When uh, it comes to uh, data breach notification, uh, then it is also a deciding fact factor. And uh, as well as when a, a supervisory authority uh, wishes to impose a fine or decides to, Im not wishes, de decides to impose a fine, then it's also a very important factor to check if the assessment was mandatory, it, if it had been done or not, and if it had been done satisfactorily. So uh, I think supervisory authorities uh, can help a lot. For example, in our, um, on our website, there is a, a free software borrowed by, from uh, the French, uh, from the CNIL, from the French uh, supervisory authority, helping uh, the data controllers freely uh, to check uh, their assessment reports if everything is there and they have done it uh, properly or not. 
Thank you. I have a question. Yes. I'm wondering if you've noticed a qualitative difference in the PIAs based on whether there's a privacy officer who's really dedicated to that as opposed to someone doing it as other duties is assigned or is in the general counsel's office or the CIO's office. I'm not sure if you want an answer on the U.S. side. It's, it's really on, on the EU side. So I would say the assessments when they're done in the United States are actually quite sophisticated. I mean, we have a large staff, for example, within the Department of Homeland Security, the Office of the Chief Privacy Officer, where they complete many of these uh, privacy impact assessments. And we have to read them very carefully if we're planning to challenge them, uh, because typically the analysis is actually quite good, uh, which isn't to say that we agree entirely, but a lot of detailed work is done. I'll tell you about a related case which we're currently involved with that I think is uh, responsive to your question. Um, the question on the uh, census in the United States regarding one's citizenship status is very controversial. And uh, for over 60 years, we've not asked people in the United States when they answer the census, which they're required by law to do, um, to state whether or not they're a citizen. So this past year, the uh, Secretary of Commerce, Mr. Ross, who's responsible for the census, decided to add this question, uh, almost an echo, by the way, of our case, because like the, um, the earlier case was about discouraging people from voting. The census question was about discouraging uh, immigrants in the United States. And uh, we decided to uh, challenge the addition of the citizenship question to the census. Uh, and this is where it gets interesting. The Census Bureau had in fact completed multiple privacy impact assessments that were quite detailed but they completed the privacy impact assessments for an earlier version of the census that did not include the citizenship question. And so our claim was that there was a legal obligation to update the privacy impact assessment by virtue of the fact that the data collection now proposed uh, was most, both more expansive and also quite clearly more controversial. And uh, some would say, well, that's a bit of a, a technical violation if they already have a privacy impact assessment. But if you understand the purpose of the assessment, and if you are also aware that the secretary indicated that the census data might be transferred to the Department of Justice for the purpose of legal enforcement, which is even more controversial, then you would see that there was obviously a need to conduct the privacy impact assessment. So I would say even when they're detailed, they also have to be uh, timely and comprehensive with respect to the type of data that's being collected. Just to, to add that the tricky thing is that uh, such an assessment uh, report uh, comes into light when there is a problem before or during uh, the uh, publishing of, of this report. So it's highly, highly recommendable and advisable to uh, to sign it by an authorized uh, person. If uh, it comes to uh, an official use of this uh, document, then of course it has the, the formal criterion. Uh, so uh, the stricter interpretation is always the better. So I, if, if that was the question, I, I would advise uh, to have it signed by the data protection officer and the management or the uh, person authorized to represent the company or, or the data controller. Thanks very much for a fascinating panel. A lot of terrain has been already covered, but um, I had a general question. Do you see um, the emergence of sort of a global standard, and uh, maybe the GDPR uh, being one model, uh, for how you conduct privacy impact assessments in the electoral context? Um, or is it still that these are worlds apart? Thank you. I'll, I'll start with just... Um, I think that there, there is um, some standards being set and in terms of like what's now considered 
risky and, and what needs assessment. And I think everyone's like, oh, yeah, we need someone to look at the data. And I think that it's becoming like a bit more normal to just talk about it and think about security. Maybe not quite the exact steps that need to be taken apart. Um, um, but I think that the standard that's being set there is being set in for political parties or campaigning groups or anything. And I don't think it's being set for private companies um, who are the ones who are doing so much of it or like that are then like acting as intermediaries and providing the profiles or doing the targeting themselves um, with that data. I think, so I think that it's setting a standard for the people who weren't really thinking about it much already and now they have to think about it. And I don't think it's setting the standard for the people who've been thinking about it for quite a while. But I'm, I'm, that would be like quite speculative. I would say that in the U.S., uh, the E-Government Act provision, which was adopted in 2003, is actually very good for the U.S. Uh, federal government. It really is uh, comprehensive. But of course, it reaches only uh, the federal government, so it doesn't reach the private sector as the GDPR does. And the other thing that it doesn't do, which I think the GDPR does address, is uh, the problem of profiling and algorithmic decision-making which we have argued needs to be incorporated into the GDPR data protection impact assessment because it is uh, so fundamental to how determinations are, are made about people. Um, and of course, we'd like to see the US law reflect that approach uh, with regard to the private sector because of course, as you also suggested, most of the uh, deep profiling that takes place is, is by the private companies. They have 4,000 data points, uh, not a dozen. Great, thank you. This is going to be the last question. A uh, really quick one. Uh, I really think that there is a role for civil society organizations to interrogate both the outcome of the DPA and the methodology behind it. My question is, do you actually, in, there is no requirement to publish DPA under the GDPR. So would you say if, for example, civil society or data subject would file the request with a company to provide them a copy with the DPA report, would that company be obliged to do so under the GDPR? I don't know, we, we haven't dealt with such a question, but since uh, I'm responsible for freedom of information matters in, in my authority, I would, I would say that uh, I would investigate this question from freedom of information side, maybe. But uh, I, I don't know the, the correct answer. Maybe it, would, it should be investigated upon a case-by-case -case basis. And that requirement actually does exist in US law, so it's not sufficient to simply complete the privacy impact assessment, it must, uh, well, there's a presumption will be made public. There are certain national security exceptions, but the presumption is that it will generally be made public. Which I think is a presumption that makes a lot of sense. Um, so with that, um, I, I want to, to thank the panel. Before I do, I want to encourage everyone to stay for the EPIC Awards, which are going to be happening um, in this room in about 15 minutes. Um, but please join me in thanking this really excellent panel.